Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Thank you for joining today's session entitled This Intersection of the Future of Work and Internships. Thank you for uh, logging in. We're gonna give a, a people a few more minutes. I have 1226 local time. Um, so we'll start uh, hopefully as close to 1.30 as possible. Uh, sorry, 1.26 local time. We'll start as close to 1.30 as possible. So hang tight and uh, we'll start soon. Thank you. If you've just logged in, um, welcome to the session, the intersection of the future of work and internships. Uh, we're just gonna give it a couple more minutes before we begin, but I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll back, be back to you in about two minutes at 1.30 Eastern time uh, and we'll, we'll get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Thank you for joining today's session, the intersection of the future of work and internships. I just want to do a, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, today's session is going to be recorded and will be available on the internship-network.org website uh, following uh, our session today. And also, as you can see, or I hope you can see uh, if you're able, uh, we have closed captioning available. And uh, I will do my best to describe the, um, the session slides as they come up. The opening slide that we have has a picture of Hamza Khan, who is our featured speaker today. Uh, Hamza is, uh, is, a, is a man who's in his early 30s, who is of South Asian descent, and, uh, and we're lucky to have him here today. So I wanted to, before we begin our discussion, I want to introduce everyone who's part of today's presentation. My name is Matt Burns. I'm the founder of the International Internship Network. Uh, many of you may know me uh, as the director of the Global Internship Conference, which is a position that I had for close to 10 years. And as, 
as the name would suggest, the International Internship Network is indeed that. It's a community of internship providers, university and college advisors and, and faculty, governments, complementary organizations, and students. So I want to thank you all for joining us here today. I'm a huge proponent of accessibility. It's important that we have content and events that are affordable and accessible. Today's session is sponsored by the International Experience Canada program, which is represented by Liz Hong Farrell, who I've known for close to 10 years, thanks to her attendance at the Global Internship Conference, and I've seen at many other conferences over the years. So welcome, Liz, to today's session, and thank you very much uh, for being our sponsor. If people aren't aware of the International Experience Canada program, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could give us a, an update and an overview of the program. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Has it really been 10 years? Oh, my goodness. Time definitely <laughs> flies when you're having fun. Uh, happy to introduce an International Experience Canada. But first, I do want to say that I am speaking to you from Ottawa on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, and that my pronouns are she, her, and L. IEC, International Experience Canada, is really pleased to be sponsoring Hamza and this discussion. Uh, IEC is a government of Canada program that manages bilateral relations with over 30 partner countries. Canadians between 18 and 35 can obtain a work permit to work and travel in these partner countries. But as a reciprocal program, youth citizens from those countries can also do the same here in Canada. Many of you know that IEC is known as the Working Holiday Program but there are also streams for internships and co-op placements. So we are very, very excited to hear from and learn from Hamza's talk today. Thanks, Liz. And I just want to uh, describe this slide. It's, I'm remiss that I've, I've forgotten to do what I set out to do in the first place. So there is a picture of myself who is a uh, middle-aged male clinging to his forties. Um, and uh, of European and Caucasian descent. Uh, there is a picture of the uh, uh, International Internship Network logo. Uh, Liz Hong Farrell, who we just heard from, is also middle-aged. Um, she is of Asian descent, um, and uh, she's uh, located in Ottawa, as, as we mentioned, and also accompanied next to her is the International Experience Canada logo. Next slide, please. I'm also very fortunate to be joined uh, by two familiar faces for many of you, I think. Um, we have Zaman Ishad, who is the Chief Design Officer for Empower Meetings. Zaman is working on the back end and making sure that everything is running smoothly. And we also have Dr. Kate Moore, who is a former colleague as well. And she's the principal and co-founder of the Global Career Center. And Kate will be doing the curation of today's Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. So be sure to use the uh, Q&A feature of Zoom um, to uh, put in your, your questions and Kate will do her best to ask them or send them along to Liz and Hamza to uh, answer for you. So thank you both to Zaman and Kate uh, for, your, for your work today. And without further ado, we have our featured speaker, Hamza Khan. Uh, Hamza is the future of work expert, author of Leadership Reinvented. Hamza is a best-selling author and keynote speaker whose TEDx talk, Stop Managing, Start Leading, has been viewed nearly 2 million times. He is a top-ranked university educator and respected thought leader whose insights have been featured in notable media outlets such as Vice, Business Insider, and The Globe and Mail. Hamza is trusted by the world's preeminent organizations to enhance human potential and optimize performance. His clients include the likes of Microsoft, PepsiCo, LinkedIn, Deloitte, Salesforce, TikTok, and over 100 colleges and universities. As the co-founder of Skills Camp, a leading soft skills training company, Hamza is on a mission to empower leaders and teams to thrive in the future of work. Please welcome Hamza Khan. Thank you for being with us here today, Hamza. What a, what a pleasure, Matt. Thank you so much. That was a very generous introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you, my fellow panelists, and uh, 
to dive deep into this topic. This is uh, something I've been looking forward to for, for several weeks now. Well, I feel like it's, it's a really, it's a great confluence of, of your expertise when it comes to the future of work and also students and internships. So I, I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover in, mm -hmm. in a short amount of time. So maybe I'll, I'll just jump into it. So okay. we're obviously living in unprecedented times when the physical and virtual structure of work has changed at lightning speed. Can you recap where we are now after 20 months of the pandemic, how we got here and where you think we're going in the next few years? This is very top of mind for me. So um, March of 2020, my father's store, which is located in downtown Toronto in an office building was deemed non-essential. And uh, he has been waiting for 21 months now, 20, wow, it has been 21, it's been a long time now. Uh, he has been waiting for the, offices, inhabitants, all of the different organizations, corporations, nonprofits, government agencies to return to full capacity. He believes that that's going to happen. And I've been telling him um, for the last 21 months, that's not going to happen because the concept of remote work has been traveling through time for a lot longer than most of us know. Over the last 12 years alone, it has seen a nearly 160% growth worldwide. So remote work, virtual work, this concept has been in movement for a very long time. And the pandemic, if anything, has been a catalyst for this. So in the beginning, think back to the factory boom following World War II, there was a dominant style of management known as Theory X. And I talk about this in the TEDx talk that you, you alluded to earlier, Matt. Theory X is rooted essentially in uh, feelings of distrust. It's, it's, it's fundamentally anti-human. It assumes that employees are lazy, unmotivated, that they don't want to work and they need to be micromanaged. Over time, though, there has been an awakening to the opposite, which is the theory Y style of management. And these theories were, were posited by one Douglas McGregor. So are you familiar, uh, Matt, with, with Gallup's State of the Workplace report that is published every year? Uh, I've, I've heard of it. I couldn't dive into it and give you any details, but I okay, am familiar yeah. with it. Yeah. So you, you might've seen like snippets come up and, and, and every year it says the same thing. And, and, and this is the thing that flabbergasts me. It's, Gallup has been saying the same thing for more or less the, the, the past decade, that purpose is the most important thing for younger generations. It, it has, the future of work has very little to do with the dichotomy between in-person and, and virtual or hybrid for that matter. I mean, the thing that younger and younger generations, the students that many of us on this call are ultimately serving, all they care about is purpose. Are they working for an organization that's doing something important in the world? Does their personal why align with the organization's why? And will they be empowered to do that job, irrespective of what the physical, irrespective of what the office looks like? And many companies at the start of the pandemic, you know, some that come to mind, Adobe, uh, Salesforce, Spotify, Twitter, even Microsoft, who I recently spoke to, all made the switch immediately at the start of the pandemic that said, we're going to go full hybrid. Um, most companies had to go fully online, full virtual, and then gradually transition to a more hybrid approach. But I was reading in preparation for this, I think it was a survey by Mercer that found that 70% of companies are planning to adopt either a hybrid, uh, to either adopt or continue the hybrid model. So all of this, all of this is to say, Matt, the trend is here to stay. And there's actually a great, uh, I'm going to find it uh, as soon as I can, um, another report from Microsoft called the Work Trend Index that found that 66% of uh, employers around the world are redesigning their workplaces to accommodate hybrid work arrangements. And I, I've, I've, I've actually confirmed this earlier this week when I delivered a keynote from Microsoft. And I actually asked them, I said, what are you doing? Like, what, what do the campuses look like now? And they said, Hamza, it's, uh, it's a bit of a ghost town right now, but that's because we are, we are overhauling the traditional office workplace to accommodate that hybrid work arrangement. So take from that, the, the, the most important thing from what, I, what I've said over here, Matt, is that um, this has been a long time coming and it's here to stay. Right. So in terms of the, the virtual and the physical space in which uh, particularly new grads and Gen Z are, are moving towards, like as they, as they enter the workforce, is, is that addressing at all what you're talking about in terms of their priority being the purpose of the actual job? Um, is, it, is it in sync, um, in your opinion? Specifically, Matt, like the, the reconfiguration of the physical workplaces? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's one thing to, you know, have these new models in which um, 
in which uh, you know we're allowing people to either work remotely or a hybrid model where they can work both remotely and in person. So there's there's that, but also in terms of of engaging um, recent grads, is is that um, are are a lot of companies uh, attuning their their role as employers towards that. Slowly but surely, it's taking a while, uh, I, I will say. Organizations are queuing into this idea, and I think a big part of why they're, t- they're tuning into it has been this trend that I'm sure everybody here has seen at least once pop up on your feeds, the great resignation, which is this, this ongoing trend, mind you, of, of people voluntarily leaving their jobs since as early as the spring of 2021. So this, especially uh, when, when, when you look at this trend in the context of most government subsidies ending, and this trend still continuing and increasing in some cases, this has been not a great resignation, but rather a great awakening on both sides for employ- for employees realizing that they don't need to put up with the old paradigms of work that were uh, you know, oppressive, anti-human, that were preventing them from reaching their purpose. And the organizations on the other hand are realizing that they need to be much more than just employers, that they can't just entice the next generation with paychecks and roles. In fact, roles, the, the concept of roles is coming under, under a great deal of scrutiny right now, because when you think about what roles are, they're groupings of unrelated skills. Purpose clarifies what skills are needed for the specific role or the specific uh, objective, the portfolios of work that people are now taking on that, uh, you know, especially when we're talking about virtual internships, it's, it's no longer just confined to just one department or, or one specific aspect of, of the job. More and more employers are creating tours of duty. And I think that virtual work has opened up the possibility for uh, uh, interns and, and employees in general to, to, have a, to have greater access to the organization beyond what they traditionally would have if they were in a very constrained, uh, uh, narrowly defined role, if you will. Excellent, excellent. So um, I'm gonna open the next question up to Liz, um, just to kind of set the, um, the stage for us a little bit. In terms of um, students looking for international experiences, whether it be through co-ops or internships or even just study abroad programs, we've we've heard about um, student uh, pent up demand uh, for international experiences. Uh, we've heard a lot of things uh, over the pandemic, and some are true, some aren't true. What what are you seeing from from an application standpoint, uh, both uh, incoming and outgoing of Canada, Liz? Yeah, we are definitely hearing about um, about youth who are just, you know, after a year or more of virtual learning, virtual socializing, virtual everything, that they can't wait to get out. They can't wait to plan for, explore going abroad again. As some of our public opinion research tells us that Canadian youth are keen to travel when the pandemic is over, with three quarters of youth that we surveyed saying they're they're likely to, to pursue an international travel or leisure um, trip uh, before they turn 36. We've also heard from some of our academic stakeholders that more and more of their students are asking about placements abroad, particularly in some of the programs that have that mandatory requirement to have an international placement for graduation. This is where things can get tricky and I'm sure that those virtual placements for the programs in the past almost two years have literally been a degree saver. But you know, we also speak about diversity and inclusion, and IEC is also conscious about wanting to provide information to all youth. Uh, and we do want to be inclusive in our messaging so that they can see themselves taking part in an, an international uh, experience. But, you know, I'm, I'm speaking uh, mainly right now about Canadians going abroad, but we do hear questions from international youth about the same. We have ongoing questions about how and when and in what conditions can they come to Canada. Luckily, even through the pandemic, we've been able to facilitate entry for IEC youth into Canada as long as they had a job offer. So, you know, that door was was not closed permanently during uh, during some of the restrictions. But of course, with the ongoing pandemic, even though there's been a lot of interest, there hasn't been the usual pre-2019 rush to to apply and to um, get those experiences as yet. And, you know, that's simply because of the, all the varying border restrictions and and the, uh, the, the status of the vaccines and the status of, of uh, the, the health um, uh, regulations in different countries. 
and now the new variants that are appearing. So we do hear that youth are cautious about going abroad. They want to, but they, they are cautious and they're voicing concerns about things like those quarantine requirements. Uh, we do hope though that as things progress, those usual numbers that, uh, that we are normally seeing um, pre-pandemic will come back up again because youth can, can really have these life-changing experiences when they go abroad. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for filling some of the gaps in for us, Liz. Um, Hamza, I just want to go back to, um, and just so everyone gets to peek behind the curtain a little bit, we had a, we had a, a call to talk about what we were going to speak of today. And uh, one of the things that we spoke about is um, what has been lost uh, during the pandemic. And so some of the things that are obvious to, uh, to all of us, I think, on this call are some of the uh, experiences, uh, international experience, because of uh, mobility issues. Um, you just simply can't travel, or if you can, it's, it's been very difficult. But we've also talked about some of the things that perhaps that we've gained. Um, so I know virtual internships um, has certainly um, filled a, uh, a gap in, in the offering of what uh, universities have offered and what providers have offered. Hamza, I'm just wondering if you could comment on, on uh, virtual internships and some of the other gains that you've seen um, through the, um, you know, the, the evolution of the workplace. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, some of the things that have been gained, uh, so many, I, I could just list them. I mean, uh, right off the bat, we've gained time back. Uh, that has been tremendous. What we've lost, you know, just thinking about when I had my first internship uh, many, many, many years ago, it took me about an hour and a half one way to get to the physical office. And, uh, you know, when you tallied that up there and back, I was losing three hours a day. So some of my best years of, of learning and, and having the mental elasticity to sort of build the foundation for my career were spent commuting. So we've gained time. We've been able to save the money. That's also lost the opportunity cost. What's also been exciting for me with uh, the virtualization of internships is that now they've become more accessible or they've, they've been forced to become more accessible by design because now you can no longer uh, rely on some of the barriers, the physical barriers or, uh, uh, or not barriers that existed at the workplace that would exclude people. And when you have tools like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Slack or Gchat, whatever the case may be, they're now allowing people to participate in a more, uh, in a more uh, democratized way. So save time, save money, more accessible. What's been exciting for me from a leadership perspective is now uh, because the, the optics that sometimes would influence career progression when they're no longer possible because people are working from home. Now the focus truly becomes on outcomes over outputs. So just showing up early and appearing to be busy and walking through a hallway with a sense of purpose and then perhaps that convincing a leader that you might be a much more productive intern or an employee, that no longer exists in this new style, this new epoch of work. I also think that the organizations have been flattened themselves. Like I said earlier, there's less focus on roles, which are those groupings of unrelated skills and more of a focus on the skills needed to drive the competitive advantage for the organization. And um, I think also there, there, there's something to be said about safety, workplace safety. If people are working from home in environments that are familiar, controlled, I think there's also a physical safety that's gained from this transition. But in some cases, especially I think about employees who might have been susceptible to bullying and harassment, there might even be a, a, a psychological safety that might be setting in for uh, virtual workers. Excellent. Do you feel like there's been a flattening of sort of the power dynamic in terms of work um, uh, coming from a physical environment where, you know, somebody uh, could be at the, the company for 20, 25 years, uh, they're ensconced in an office, a new worker or an intern comes into that environment, and it, it can be pretty uh, daunting. Uh, whereas now, you know, we have, you know, you, you've mentioned several online platforms that we have, um, and students and young people are, you know, often added an advantage in terms of understanding the technology. In terms of the power dynamic, do you, do you think that there's been a, a massive shift or, or am I kind of over overplaying that? No, you're absolutely correct. And I, I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have 
experience the, the full spectrum of different styles of organizational leadership, you know, many, many years ago, it was actually in the Canadian Armed Forces. And, you know, that's as theory X as it gets in terms of power dynamics and hierarchy and rigid structures. And then, you know, I eventually found myself working in student affairs, which is as laissez-faire and as flat as it can get at the times. And then I was also the founder of a startup. I worked at startups. I've been a sole proprietor. And so I think I have a pretty good um, understanding at, at also a time before the conversation around hybrid work and virtual work had, had reached the, 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 the levels that it is right now. So I have noticed that, and I have heard this also from my students that I teach, that uh, this transition has given them unprecedented access because now it's forcing everybody to, to let go of their, their comfortable ways of interfacing with other employees. And I'm thinking about you know, some of the ways that I was able to develop social currency back in the day. There was the serendipitous networking that would happen in hallways and the chance encounters, small talk over coffee. You know, uh, those things now have to be replicated in a much more democratic way uh, where everybody appears on the screen. We take up the same real estate. There's no sense of there being a corner office. Some of the barriers that would reinforce what those hierarchies were in an office no longer exist. You know, sometimes even when when... I imagine there's people who, who've been surprised during the pandemic to see their boss, to see their supervisor wearing a, you know, something much more casual than they would wear if they were in the office. You know, I'm dressed up today because I, you know, I want to show up as fully and as presently as I can for you. And I get really excited and this brings out the best of me. But, you know, if I was meeting with my team, I don't think I would be as dressed up. I would probably be very casual. I'd be wearing a hoodie, uh, a t-shirt, you know, I would just be dressed like how I would be dressed at home. And I think that that opens up a different kind of dynamic that reduces the barriers, that, 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 that uh, shrinks the power distance between leaders and uh, subordinates, if you will. Excellent, excellent. So um, we've heard of companies like Google or JP Morgan sort of talking about getting back to, well, I, I suppose a new normal, quote, you know, normal. Mm -hmm. um, and if that happens, so they're saying, you know, we do have offices that we expect employees to go to. Uh, we expect them in some cases like JP Morgan uh, to be back, you know, working full hours and, and being there in person and probably wearing a suit to your, uh, to your comment about a suit. It has the last two years, is that gonna put um, sort of the, the new uh, generation to the workforce? Is that going to put them at a disadvantage that they haven't had that experience in a physical environment? And, and how can, you know, do you have any tips that will allow them to, to catch up quickly uh, if, that, if that is the case that they find themselves in? So, so my answer here uh, might not be well received by any employers that are insisting on that rigid return to office, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., suited, booted sort of uh, Right. Uh, uh, paradigm. So, so I, I, I welcome any opposing perspectives over here. I think that, you know, iron, iron sharpens iron, my opinions, uh, and, and any dissenting opinions need to be engaged so that we can find a better version of truth over here. So I would greatly encourage in the chat or people to unmute themselves and let me know if they disagree with this. But I actually think, Matt, the onus is flipped. The onus is now on employers to be more focused on the employee experience. And again, the great resignation, the big quit, whatever we want to call it, I truly think it's the great awakening where tomorrow's employees and especially Gen Y and Gen Z and whatever generation comes after that, like I said, this was a trend a long time coming. They're realizing even with the government subsidies ending, they don't need to go back and put up with that sort of leadership style that is rooted in the theory X outdated paradigm. Because the Gallup state of work has shown that what, empl what employers, tr what employees truly want is they want the ability to do what they do best. They want greater work-life balance and personal and better personal well-being. They want greater stability and job security. They want a significant increase in income and they want the opportunity to work for a company with a great brand. It actually has very little to do with all of the, the window dressing, all the theatrics and all of the things that are not conducive to people just doing the best work that they can free from all of the other fixings. Um, I think that the onus, again, is on the employers to be more involved in the lives of their employees and to provide a financial, a, a physical, and a mental well-being support system, and to ultimately reduce the focus on outputs 
and focus on outcomes. And that has been another positive, another benefit that has come from this transition, where working from home has now prevented people who are maybe coasting at an organization, who are relying on all of the theatrics that were just described right now. Now the, now, now the focus is just on your, out, on, your out, on, your, on your outcomes. Can you actually get the job done? Are you self-motivated? Are you uh, productive at home? Are you disciplined in your work? And can you actually move the needle on work? Um, I, I, I think that's, that's what's ultimately going to win out over here. And any organization that is insisting on returning back to normal the way it was before, I think they have another thing coming for them. I think that they're going to have a really tough time attracting top talent. They are going to be able to fill their roles, but they're not going to be with the, the talent that will be necessary for them to outlast whatever coming changes are on the horizon. Excellent. It, I, th I think uh, a lot of your comments can sort of be encapsulated with the term engagement, which I want to mm -hmm. get back to you on in just a minute. Sure. I, I'm going to just uh, involve Liz uh, in my next question. And that's with regards to study abroad in general, um, internships, co-ops, um, international internships, international co-ops. I know um, that here in North America, certainly the US, Canada, um, and there's a few other Western countries, we are sadly underrepresented by our students and young people going abroad for international experiences. Um, what, uh, and I, I've heard there's been a lot of uh, funding come available from the, the Canadian government. So Liz, in terms of like diversity, equity, inclusion, what, what are some of the goals of the Canadian government or the IEC program in students going abroad? And, and uh, uh, how do you think that we can, we can best reach those goals? Well, I think it's, it's really all about giving Canadian youth the tools that they need to develop and contribute to Canada. I think that is the, the underlying objective. Uh, because we've seen from so many studies for so long that yes, the nature of work is changing and the skills that are required in the labor market are also changing. Um, and as the world becomes more interconnected, markets become more and more global, young Canadians need to increasingly be able to show that they have those global competencies that employers are looking for, whether it be virtual or in-person. Skills like adaptability, problem solving, good communication skills, but it also about cultural awareness and cultural sensitivity. International research also shows us that youth who go abroad to work or study as part of their education, they have stronger labor market outcomes after graduation. They have higher earnings, lower unemployment, for example. But you're right, culture of mobility is not a concept that's ingrained in Canada. Um, in European um, Samoceanic countries, it's definitely more about uh, not if you're going abroad, but when and where are you going? So our Canadian culture still doesn't yet see the value of those experiences as a natural option for personal and professional development. So, you know, as a result, there have been some studies that have said that Canadian youth are going to lag behind other youth in, in different countries in terms of those global competencies and being able to function uh, and be more culturally aware because of that uh, lack of um, mobility. Excellent. Um, I, I know that there, I see five questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to open it up soon to the audience's questions. Uh, but I do want to go back to Hamza um, in particular with regards to uh, virtual internships and hybrid internships. A lot of those, those programs are, um, you know, they are uh, project-based. Um, and so a lot of the, uh, the timelines are set uh, by the students themselves or, or their universities um, in terms of deliverables and, uh, and deadlines and that sort of thing. And I've heard anecdotally that there's been sort of mixed re results about uh, the meaningfulness of these programs because uh, through a combination of, um, you know, uh, time changes, um, and the ability to actually, you know, um, interact with colleagues. Um, there's, there's been, as I said, mixed results as to these project-based programs. Do you have any uh, 
any tips or any thoughts about how employers can best engage uh, students uh, in terms of some of the project-based uh, internships that they're doing, and also how universities and colleges can prepare students for, for that type of um, model uh, for their program. You know, just, just as an aside, you know, back when we were doing actual in-person in internships, as, as the majority of the programs, uh, the student, you know, would go into, uh, into, their, into their internship, probably Monday to Friday, nine to five, and they would see in person their, their managers on a daily basis, so they would get their input. But now, you know, there's this remoteness and, it, and it, there's a lot of factors that could come into play. So um, Hamza, I don't know if you have any tips that you could, you could provide our audience on that, and we'd yeah. love to hear it. Uh, ex excellent question, and, and Matt, uh, I, I'll encourage you to cut me off if I if I if I drone no, on over please. here because I have so I have so many tips that I want to give you. This Go is actually it. really top of mind for me because uh, I teach a social media class at Ryerson, and I try to place students to job shadow and do internships. And one of my students was actually able to land an internship. She's based here in Toronto, but she's doing an internship with Tencent over in China. And I thought that was really fascinating, except she reached out to me earlier this week and she said, Hums, I'm having a really, really tough time. It's a virtual internship. And uh, she feels like her workflow is very reactive. And so these are the, the actual tips that I gave her. I said, first of all, do you have clear objectives and key results? Have you defined what success in your role looks like? And this is the one thing that I find is, mo is common across anybody who's, who's feeling overwhelmed, who's feeling like they're not having a good employee experience, is they haven't defined what success looks like. There's a great book by John Dewar called Measure What Matters, and it, it breaks down the whole process of creating objectives and key results. What do you need to get done and how will you know you're getting there? So that's one model. The second model is areas of responsibility. What is within your portfolio? So first address clarity and, and gain that. Understand what you're responsible for, when it needs to get done. Then I also asked her to demand from her employer better overlap time because she was waking up in the middle of the night to synchronize with their time zone. And the same thing happens here in North America. I've also heard the opposite where foreign students doing virtual internships in North America have to adjust their timelines to react to the you know, North American Canadian centricity of the office over here. But there are great websites right now that can just show you the best times to have that overlap time. What would be an ideal time between the hours of nine to five, if at all possible, somewhere else in the world? and syncing up over here. You don't need to have synchronous time all the time. You can do asynchronous work. You know, for example, I, uh, I, was, I was liaising with one of my employees in Singapore. And what we would do is we would record voice questions, voice notes for each other. They'd ask me a question via voice and I'd respond via voice. There was also another platform that we use called Noom, or sorry, Loom, L-O-O-M, where I could record video uh, questions and then have them answer. And so when I logged on at the start of the day, it would be like we were just finishing that conversation. So we would just add a little bit, bit of asynchronicity to our work. Uh, improving one-on-ones, if you're not already having them with your employer, insist on them. Ideally, what you wanna do is have a weekly one-on-one -on -one and make sure that it's structured, it doesn't move, that you're, you're not moving it unless there's an emergency. In this one-on-one, -on -one, use it as an opportunity to speak about how you're doing at the organization, what your employee experience has been like, what kind of support you need, what kind of growth opportunities are ahead of you. And then on that note, just a couple of big picture things that uh, uh, employers can do when it comes to virtual internships. This takes me back to my days working in student affairs at University of Toronto and at Ryerson respectively, good orientations. Um, the research shows that an, a good orientation experience in the first 60 days of any first year students' student journey is critical to their overall engagement and retention. So think about what you can do to make sure that when you are onboarding interns, that they're engaged from the jump. Give them a full calendar of programming. Have them meet with different people in the organization. Have them shadow people, learn. Uh, one thing I love to do with my interns specifically is I get them to reverse engineer the organization. So I give them this really cool exercise where I say, just don't go on our website, just whatever you know about this company, reverse engineer what our mission, vision, values, principles, and purpose are. And then present them to me and let's synchronize them with how we actually talk about ourselves. And this comes back to another part of my life, which is branding. And you want to synchronize how you see yourself as an organization, how others see yourself, and how you want to be seen. 
Another thing that you can do here, Matt, uh, and again, please cut me off because I can keep on giving. No, you stuff no, I'm I'm loving it. I'm sure everyone <laughs> is, uh, is loving it. We've been it's okay, been well, a it's it's been a something that people have been asking a lot about. So please let, go let ahead. me give, let me give you like two or three more over here. Perfect. Uh, give a never ending stretch project. And one that I love doing uh, is is incur and and this is this is the other thing too. Interns for an organization are the competitive ed uh, edge, in my opinion, especially in this day and age, where it's so easy for a brand manager or the CEO of the organization to lose sight of the changing world around them. Interns at this specific age, Gen Z especially, are so tapped into the zeitgeist that they can give you invaluable data faster than you can get from any other source. So ask them to invent or come up with alternatives to your existing programs, services, events, or business offerings, and think of a company that would put you out of business. So entrust them with that responsibility. They'll feel like that's, you know, uh, you're inviting them to co-create the organization. Give them, give them a part of your business and say, how would you do this better, faster, or cheaper? Another thing that's forgotten about is uh, professional development for interns. We assume that the, the internship experience is the professional development in and of itself, but go beyond that. Encourage them to come up with their own self-directed professional development plan that includes books, courses, videos, um, you know, uh, uh, tours of duty that would see them networking with people outside of the organization. And then I'll end by saying this, overhaul your social activities. And this actually harkens back to an earlier question about what was lost, uh, Matt, or what was gained rather. And I think what, what has been gained, and I, I can speak from personal experience here, I always felt out of place in my traditional work environments where the only way we would socialize was by drinking alcohol. That was considered to be the most inclusive at the time. And don't get me wrong, the, the leaders who were insisting on that, they had the best of intentions, but they were just doing what was being what was taught to them. I would always feel out of place in those situations. And what has happened now is uh, organizations and leaders have, have been forced to rethink how to engage their employees online. And you can't just all sit around at home with drinks in your hand and have a conversation because then right. what naturally happens is some people tend to some people tend to close off. Um, you know, the, the loudest people in the room take up all the space, so on and so forth. So right. consider leaders the unique backgrounds and personalities of all the people in your organization. Think about parents, think about non-drinkers, for instance, if that is your go-to. Think about uh, you know, people who identify with different accessibility needs, who have different accessibility needs. Uh, think about BIPOC communities, the LGBTQIA plus communities. You know, in fact, make this easy. Ask them for ideas on what to do, and you'll be surprised. They'll recommend things like, uh, you know, I've, I've done a couple of team builders during the pandemic. I've had a, a magician, a virtual magician. I've had a comedy show. I've had an escape room, believe it or not, that was conducted on Zoom. I thought that was really cool. Um, you know, we've had, uh, uh, you know, competitive games and whatnot. So overhaul your social activities. And, and this would be something that would really resonate with your younger generations who are, 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 are very focused on organizations that have a strong DEI or EDI mandate rather. Um, it's not enough to just have diversity at your organization, but you also have to actively engage them. That is fantastic. And if you don't mind, I would love to, I'm gonna re-watch this recording and I think I'll, I'll take your top 10 tips or Hamza's tips or something <laughs> and share them uh, with our audience because I'm sure uh, people have been uh, furiously uh, writing down uh, uh, the tips that you've just given. So thank you very much. I'll give for that. you one, one more question yes, over yes, here. Yes, please do. Mind. So uh, I, I've been seeing a lot of tech companies do this. They personalize the onboarding experience by mail. And this is the thing, because we're all working from home, we have to bring the office to you. They're personalizing the onboarding experience by creating a box of all of the things that you would probably have on your desk on your first day of your internship you know, a mug, a t-shirt, lanyard, whatever the case may be, create a fun kit and then mail them to your uh, interns, mail them to your employees and let them know that welcome to the team. You're here, join the team. This is a gift for you. And don't just stop there at the, at the uh, onboarding experience. Think about ways that you can include this into, you know, maybe monthly socials or, or quarterly reviews. Use the expectation now that the world comes to us via delivery Use that to your advantage. Your, your, your employees are already primed, no pun intended. They're already primed for that kind of experience. Right. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, I think we've heard enough of me uh, talking and asking questions, and I know that there's lots of great questions. I just want to go to the next slide, Zaman, if we could, and just describe this is a uh, this is a slide uh, that was given to me by Kate Moore, who is our Q&A uh, curator, which is uh, very appropriate. And uh, just so people in the audience know, um, it's somebody standing at a uh, podium on a stage. Uh, they had obviously given a speech and uh, there's an audience, uh, there's a line of people who are about to ask a question. And the caption underneath the, uh, the image is, We'd now like to open the floor to shorter speeches disguised as questions. So uh, with, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to send it over to Kate, uh, who I know has been monitoring the, the Q&A feature. And Kate, uh, perhaps you could ask uh, the first question to, uh, to Hamza. Happy to do so. And I believe I'm setting us up for more of Hamza's tips. So be ready. Um, get, your, get your pins ready. Um, combining a few questions that have come in regarding isolation in the workplace and how current employees may feel that, how students may feel that, and what are some ways that, you know, we as employers can overcome that, as educators can help, help students support students in that, that journey, and also tips for students regarding isolation. Um, and then also just had a, a comment regarding mentorship and uh, social capital, I believe, um, as other areas related to that as well. So over to you. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it, it, this has been something that has come up with my students time and again, these feelings of isolation, profound loneliness that have been creeping in. I mean, they were always a problem even before the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic has exacerbated them too. So I think from a uh, you know, a leadership perspective, one thing that you can do right away is just to be vulnerable about your own experiences during the pandemic. It's been lonely for me too. It's been lonely for you too. It's been lonely for leaders in general. We've, we've been away from our family, away from our friends. There's been massive changes and disruptions to our social life as well. So making it known to students, making it known to interns that we are going through this as well, I think will help to normalize the experience to start with. And then also be intentional about your check-ins and your frequent uh, one-on-ones, make sure that they stay. So a couple of check-ins you can introduce over here. You can do a morning stand-up uh, at the start of the workday. And it's, you know, and think about creative ways to address this if people are working in different time zones. But I used to use Slack before with one of my teams. And at the start of the day, we would do a check-in. Let me actually, let me, let me, let me give you the full array of the different types of check-ins that we have. So on Mondays, coming back from the weekend, we do like a, how was your weekend? Give us a high and a low. What was the high of your weekend? What was the low of your weekend? And this is a great way to build empathy for one another. We can understand and, and, and feel compassion when it comes to the lows. And maybe we'll realize that we're not alone in feeling what we're feeling. But the highs also give us a, an opportunity to vibe a little bit higher, to feel and participate in the joy and the things that are going well in other people's lives. So do the weekend reflections. Then every day, Monday to Friday, at the start of the day, we do like a quick 15 to 10 to 15 minute huddle. How's everyone doing? What are you working on? What are your top priorities for the day? What are some blockers that are getting in the way of you doing your best work and how can other people help you? So again, this is done in the spirit of getting people to be accountable to one another in terms of what they're working on, but then it also gives the leaders the opportunity to see any trends that might be emerging, to see if any burnout is setting in, to see if there's any particular um, uh, obstacles that they would be able to remove from them, from, from the path of, of their, their uh, employees. And then uh, try your best every, every month to do like some sort of monthly town hall, state of the union. Here's how the organization is doing. Here's how you're contributing to the organization. And then on Fridays, what we actually did probably six months into the pandemic is we actually changed that morning stand up and we made it an hour long and we just did a coffee hang. We just say, everybody brew coffee, brew some tea, and let's just chat for an hour, two hours over there. Uh, sometimes overlap lunches as well. So everybody turn your cameras on and let's just have lunch together. So find ways that you can actively engage your employees during the workday throughout the week and don't create a situation in which the last time you saw your employee or student was last week or you only hear, about, hear from them asynchronously. Be very intentional about creating different opportunities for them to attend, but also be wary of virtual meeting fatigue. Don't overdo it. Make sure you're checking in with your people as well and letting them let you know if it's too much or too little. That's great. Um, I, I see there's a question from, sorry, just let me find it again, uh, from Frank, um, who's asking about Avenues International students 
can explore to secure co-op placements in Ontario, Canada. So in terms of the uh, framework, uh, Liz, perhaps I can throw this over to you um, about um, applying for the IEC program uh, for uh, students who are outside of Canada, and then I can sort of touch on the actual placement uh, process itself. Sure. Um, so one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that IEC is not only for students. Um, it's for youth in general between certain ages, so 18 to 35. But, um, you know, I would definitely suggest that people look at uh, the array of uh, avenues that students can come through to, to do their internships and to do their co-ops. Because, you know, as much as I would love to have people only think about IEC, there are other options that are likely um, better for them, depending on what they want to do. Excellent. Yeah, and in terms of, I, I think one of the things that Ontario has done traditionally very well is the co-op program. And it is, uh, it's a combination of government support, um, schools such as the University of Waterloo, Ryerson, um, uh, there's there's plenty of other schools that, that just don't come to mind right now. Um, and so if students are in terms uh, interested in actually attending those schools, um, they are very much interested in having international students attend them. Um, and then they often have very um, robust co-op programs as part of their degrees. Um, so that's one way. Uh, in terms of uh, students and young people coming to do an internship, um, there are also provider organizations, which I won't say here now, um, but if you were to go to the IEC website, you can find uh, something called recognized organizations, and they can help uh, find a placement for you. So, um, Frank, that's how I would uh, respond to, to your question. Um, if you want any sort of follow up, uh, we can provide you some more information as well. Um, Thanks, Kate. I was just going to, I was just going to talk right. about the recognized organizations. All right. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? I, I think it's also, um, you know, it, important to note that with IEC, it is a longer uh, work permit, a, a longer term than than some students would, would get. So, you know, really look at those options and look at what's available uh, because there are quite a number. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Kate, I'm going to throw it back over to you um, to ask Mike True's question. And before you do, I just have to give a shout out to Mike. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mike uh, retired from Messiah College, I think, uh, two or three years ago, which in terms of uh, timing, he probably has the best timing of any man on this uh, on this call right now. Um, and uh, but he's very much he's probably busier than ever. Ever he's a budding uh, author, and he also um, is an expert in terms of internships, certainly in the U.S. and also internationally. So uh, we I want to uh, uh, mention Mike and appreciate his support over the years. Um, so Kate, I'll send uh, send it over to you to ask his question. Sure thing, and an honor to channel Mike True. So thank you for that. Um, building upon Hamza's comments regarding uh, the new approaches to work, such as individual tour of duties, uh, Mike asks: First of all, um, I foresee more individuals coming together in teams for projects from both inside and outside an organization, similar to how you may see professionals lending their skills to create a movie, completing it, and then moving on to the next movie. He asks to be foresee the same. And then further asks, what type of leadership skills will employers need to incorporate and, uh, and organize or implement um, as they incorporate uh, independent contractors and interns into these types of teams? What a, <clears throat> Mike, what a, what, a, what a great question. I, I could sense this as early as 2016 when I was running a, a startup, a, a marketing startup. And uh, you know, like, like my peers, I had defined roles. There was marketing coordinators, graphic designers, and content writers, so on and so forth. But the projects that we were ingesting into the organization, they required much more than the skills that we had as defined by the roles. But then it turned out that we would have people volunteer to join a particular project, and they would go outside of their predefined or, or prescribed roles. For example, we had a graphic designer that also happened to be a fantastic a uh, script writer. And so when we had a video project, this graphic designer put their hand up and said, can I work on this? And 
that was a wake up call for my co-founder and I to say, what if we were to just do away with roles altogether and just define everybody as a marketing and communication specialist and let them identify what their skills are. And we started to index their skills and had them tell us, you know, I've got mastery of the Adobe creative suite. I'm also a great copywriter. I'm also a great salesperson, so on and so forth. And then we started to create pods and pods was a really interesting concept for us where we would assign people to projects on an as needed basis. And so your analogy of how films are made, I think is really apt over here. And I just recently learned this from one of my friends who works in the film industry, that every film is a corporation. Every film is essentially a small startup. And I never thought about that. For example, you know, uh, what's a movie that I just saw recently or a movie that's coming up that I'm excited for, The Fourth Matrix. I'm sure The Matrix 4 exists as a corporation and all of the people who come together to work on that project are employees who are just in time. They're essentially like a large pod formed around that. This, I think, is, is a trend that we need to pay attention to because when you think about tours of duty, people working on different projects or, or different comp working for different companies and coming back to their home base, also people thinking about their work as not just I'm an employee of this company, this employee is part of a larger portfolio of work. It's very common now, and, and at the start of all of, my, all of my classes, I ask my students, where do you work and what do you do? And I've seen a trend over the last five years that many of them are self-employed. Many of them have quote unquote side hustles, whatever that looks like. They're running you know, uh, Shopify stores, they're DJing on the side, whatever the case may be. And they also happen to have traditional jobs, but they don't think about those jobs as their primary employer. Their employer represents a fraction, sometimes a large fraction of their overall portfolio of work. So what employers need to do is accept that this is something that's happening. And if they want to command a larger piece of that pie, then they need to, again, the onus is on the employers to make themselves a more desirable place for that employee to spend more of their time, to give more of their time, energy and attention to. Because whether, whether unless it's stipulated in a contract, Rest assured that your employees are open and primed to this new style of working, and they are going to find opportunities that will afford them more flexibility. So the, 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 the skills that leaders can incorporate to, to welcome and empower these, this next generation of employees would be uh, empathy, compassion, uh, agility, flexibility, communication, um, but also the most important thing would be a growth mindset. I think that is perhaps the most important skill that any leader or any employee can cultivate for this new paradigm of work. And I would say the growth mindset is the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn, and to repeat that cycle over and over again. Wonderful. Uh, Kate, I think we have a couple more questions from, from your end. Sure thing. And this is regarding the unintended consequences of virtual internships and virtual international internships. So I'm going to ask both Hamza and Liz to speak to opportunities for funding, um, concerns about creating a two-tiered um, approach where those who can afford to travel will travel, and potentially those who are not able to travel um, uh, are, are are sort of um, guided to virtual internships. So I would ask each of you to speak a bit about how um, one of those unintended consequences, which has allowed for more accessibility, but also thinking about how we build the back and, and, and build virtual into on-site and hybrid, how to do that in a way that is equitable um, as well. Liz, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll default to you on this one to get things started, if you don't mind. I, I want to gather my thoughts, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so, yes, it is a concern for, for us, uh, especially, you know, when we are talking about people going, youth going, um, traveling to, to these various countries, uh, partner countries that we have, because, you know, there is a cost. There, there's not only the, the direct cost of travel and living there, but also, you know, some of the lost opportunity costs. Uh, that uh, that they you know can't get back because they're giving up an apartment or they're giving up a, a job that they need to support themselves when they're back in Canada. Um, but we, you know, IEC is a self-funded, self-directed program. So you know, unfortunately, we don't have funding to provide to to youth who want to do this. Um, but we do want to be as inclusive as possible. So we we work with as many stakeholders as we can to not only get information out um, 
to, to support youth. And, and we're talking about all youth as well as our uh, communities of interest that we deal with, um, in, for example, indigenous youth, um, LGBTQ2 youth, uh, disadvantaged. We, we want to be as open and transparent as we can to, to see where there can be opportunities where organizations can partner together to make it happen. So, you know, we're constantly on the lookout for, for partnerships to do that. But, you know, it's not only our program that's looking at this, uh, our colleagues in Employment and Social Development Canada, they, in 2019, the government announced uh, the outbound mobility pilot as part of its international education strategy. And that was to promote study and work abroad opportunities for Canadian college and university students. Uh, it's funded at about 95 million over six years. So this pilot, you, you might know it uh, also as the Global Skills Opportunity Pilot. Um, it has three key objectives and you know, it's to widen access to students, particularly those from underrepresented groups, to encourage work and study abroad opportunities in non-traditional countries, uh, to, to expand that diversity and to promote innovation to support approaches that reduce those barriers to participation. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that between groups like that and programs like that, uh, things that we might be able to do through partnerships that we, we can support more and more Canadian youth going abroad. And, and Liz, I'll, I'll add to that. And it got me thinking about a question from Matt earlier about, you know, things lost, things gained, I think, um, so some other barriers that exist when it comes to virtual internships, lack of uh, uh, career mobility, um, you know, the lack of the serendipity, the chance encounters that happen, lack of social interaction. And sometimes what I see on the other side of our research was like, which is like a dehumanization of the employee because they've just been reduced down to essentially a tile on a virtual meeting. And, uh, you know, the, sometimes the, 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 the disproportionate focus on out put on outcomes, uh, is sometimes there's no, there's less patience for any underperformance over there because you haven't had the opportunity to create those social relationships and build up social capital. And so sometimes high productivity can mask underlying problems as well, like burnout, growing inequities, lack of empathy, lack of inclusion and whatnot. Um, I think back to one of my first internship experiences. So I worked at Sony Music Entertainment at the start of my career and uh, I wasn't paid a lot. I think I was paying a stipend of $15 a day. I would actually lose money when I factored in the TTC going there and coming back and lunch and whatnot. I will just say right off the bat, I am a, I'm a champion of paid internships. But with that being said, sometimes I also coach my students and I would be open to this as well because I suppose I even do this as a public speaker, which is uh, I will sometimes take on an opportunity if there's something else to be gained from it too. Uh, and, and sometimes the, the reward let me, let me be careful about how I phrase this because I realize this is a touchy subject, right? Um, there, there are times when, when the learning, the growth, and the self-actualization that comes from an opportunity is much more valuable than, uh, than a paycheck. And again, I want to be very careful when I say that. Um, there are, I, I, I do believe that, that, that employers should pay their employees, and, and I have tried throughout my entire career as an internship provider to at least offset any, any cost incurred by the interns to participate in that opportunity. But uh, sometimes we have to leave it up to the intern themselves, depending on, on our uh, financial circumstances or, or what kind of subsidies are available or not available to us. Um, maybe I just wanna end my answer over there because I think I'm still, I'm still reaching a little bit of a knowledge gap over here. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we'll leave it at that. That's okay. Well, that's probably the only knowledge gap that we've uh, we've seen from you today, so, uh, <laughs> Hamza, because you've been a font of information, and I thank you so much for for joining our our session today. It is uh, I've I've come away with a lot of great information uh, from both you and from Liz and uh, and Kate as always is is always a font of information as well. Um, and I know that we didn't get to all the questions. Um, if you have anything further that you would like uh, responded to or any uh, further information that you're looking, please feel free to send me an email. If it's in regards to Hamza 
or anything that came up. If it's in regards to the IEC program, uh, Liz's email is uh, posted uh, uh, below her, her picture. Um, and as I said at the beginning, the recording will be available on our website, uh, probably starting tomorrow. Um, and I will send out an email to everyone. Uh, but I, once again, I, I just wanna show my profound appreciation to Hamza for being part of the, this discussion today. Uh, for Liz uh, and IEC for supporting it, and for the audience who has tuned in. Uh, I know that you're all busy, particularly this time of year, end of term, um, and I hope you have come away with a, a meaningful session, and we hope to do this on a regular basis, so be on the lookout for uh, what's coming up in terms of the newsletter and a session in January. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for tuning in and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and a holiday season and uh, and take care and please be in touch if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if I may just uh, add over here, I think on behalf yes. of all, all my panelists would agree, Matt, a uh, huge thank you to you. You're a fantastic facilitator. You asked incredible <laughs> questions and thank you for arranging this meeting of minds today. I mean, uh, uh, Fantastic. You, you deserve. You deserve but you're you're very humble, sir. I must say. So, so, oh, so thank you. Thank huge you. Shout well, out to ho you. Hopefully, we'll see you on the streets of Toronto uh, soon, and uh, and uh, we we can uh, have a longer discussion that maybe we can uh, we can live stream to somebody or something like that. I, anyway, I would love that. And okay. uh, and and folks tuning in like uh, this isn't goodbye. It's see you later. So please yes. reach out to me wherever you'd like, uh, and um, I'd be more than happy to carry on this conversation. Fantastic. All right, everyone, have a great day, and thanks again for tuning in. Take care. Take Bye -bye. care, everyone. Bye. Thank you.